Would you do whatever you could to get out of being enlisted in the army? We'll get to that in a bit, but first, a story from Saucer. Can't work on your laptop without my name badge? Guess it wasn't that critical. I worked for a university IT department as a student worker for a little over four years. We had a sister department, the Media Center, who loaned out laptops, projectors, and other technology to professors as needed. In my fourth year in employment, I was on a first-name basis with nearly all of the employees of the university, including the head of the Media Center. We'll call her Karen because, obviously. Karen was the queen of her kingdom and had quite a few obnoxious rules in place but most importantly was an ironclad employee ID policy for checking out laptops. Under normal circumstances, I completely agree with this policy. However, this wasn't a normal circumstance. We got a call from her at 4.40 on a Friday, we closed at 5, that a laptop she was trying to loan out to a very important professor wasn't able to log into the network, and she requested that we come look at it. Sure thing. I make the 10 minute walk across campus from our office to the media center with my toolkit. When I get there, I see the professor and Karen and ask to see the laptop. She says, wait, OP, you need your name badge. Where is it? Flash to my name badge, clipped to my jacket, hanging on a coat rack in the IT's office. Ah, it's on my jacket, Karen. I forgot to grab it rushing over here. I chuckled a bit. Deadpan, she says, OP, you can't work on this until you get your badge. I said, Karen, I thought this was an emergency. Do you need me to fix this right now? Yes, of course, Karen explained, but we still need to always follow policy. Fair enough. Policy is incredibly important. I'll go get my name badge. I left the office, trekked the 10 minutes back to my office. Then I picked up the phone and called her. Hey, Karen, just letting you know that because it's 520 and policy states student workers can work after hours, I'll have to come back Monday. Have a great weekend. She fumed at me for a few minutes until I essentially hung up on her. Policy is very important. She was so uptight she literally walked right into that one. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story of the day is from Prune Practical 6489 wearing sunglasses indoors. I read someone else's navel story, and it reminded me of my compliance story. I used to really have trouble with light sensitivity, likely from leaving my contacts in way longer than I should have. I finally ditched the contacts altogether and opted for glasses. I opted for civilian glasses rather than navy issue because they were downright ugly. The ones I picked had a slight tint for indoor lighting and would get darker in sunlight for use outdoors. You could still see my eyes clearly, but I was really wearing almost sunglasses indoors. This setup was fine and dandy until I was stationed on my ship. My chief passed me in the corridor one day and stopped me voicing his displeasure with my choice of eyewear, demanding that I go to medical and get navy issue glasses to wear while on the boat. While I wasn't happy with this, I of course went to see the doctor. They sent me back out to the medical center on base where I was evaluated, poked, prodded, dilated, etc. and ended up being diagnosed as photophobic a fancy word for light sensitive, they special ordered me government issued glasses and sent me back to the ship to wait for them to arrive. Took time and a couple of pairs. Shockingly, the first set sent out weren't correct, had some rose colored tint that made things worse, but I finally received my newly minted government issued glasses. They were straight up sunglasses. The doc on the ship made sure that my medical diagnosis was entered into my record and sent me off to work. I admit that I had some difficulty indoors in poorly lit areas of the ship, but I dutifully wore my ugly navy glasses. I didn't see the chief for a bit, but once I did, he popped his cork big time. He marched me right down to the doc's office on the ship and started giving the doc a hard time. He thought that I was given control over what was issued to me, so he was ready to bend me over a barrel. The doc shut him down and actually showed him my medical record and diagnosis. So much for privacy. I continued to wear my fuglies a couple of months until my chief finally relented and allowed me to return to my civilian glasses. Not sure if that happened after the commanding officer saw me, but it likely had something to do with it. All I know is, is as long as they're wearing something that is legitimately prescription, they're most likely wearing whatever is like best for them in that situation. 
I just can't imagine too many people would go to the Navy wearing sunglasses for no reason. Our next story is from a bigger hammer, how my dad didn't go to Vietnam. In 1969, my dad graduated from Rice University with a five-year master's in chemical engineering. The Vietnam War was raging, and although he and his classmates had all received deferments during their studies, their deferments were over and it was time for them to go before the draft board. Most of his classmates weren't worried because they were slated to see the Houston draft board, which had a reputation for handing out continued deferments like Halloween candy. However, my dad's from Oklahoma, which meant that he had to be evaluated by the Tulsa draft board, which was much, much stricter. Dad had applied to go to the chemical engineering PhD program at Stanford and had been accepted with a full stipend. He was excited to go, but first he had to get past the draft board. The Stanford faculty wrote a letter to the Tulsa draft board explaining that Mr. Hammer would be embarking on a research program that would greatly benefit the war effort and asking for another deferment. The Tulsa draft board wrote back in short order, Mr. Hammer had already benefited from the only deferment he was going to get and thus he was to present himself to the Army Physical Examination Center post haste. Dad was sad to lose his shot at a PhD, but not too sad, because now he could marry my mom. He'd also had several job offers already, so he accepted an offer from Exxon, and he and my mom got married. His superiors at Exxon wrote another letter to the Tulsa draft board, explaining that Mr. Hammer was now gainfully employed in the oil and gas industry, where he would be conducting engineering research that would greatly benefit the war effort, and asking for another deferment. Just as quickly, the Tulsa Draft Board wrote back, reiterating that Mr. Hammer was not going to receive another deferment, and that if he didn't hurry up and get his army physical, they might have to get the law involved. Disappointed, my dad went to his army physical as scheduled. He's always been a healthy guy, and he performed just fine on most of the examinations, up until the very end, when they measured his heart rate. It was over 100 beats per minute. Well, we can't pass you with that, the army doctor said but you're probably just nervous. Come back in two weeks and we'll give you another physical. Nervous, my dad said to himself. I can work with that. For the next two weeks, my dad spent every spare moment basically teaching himself the opposite of meditation. He'd close his eyes and think of the most horrifying mental images he could, trying to drive his heart rate as high as possible. Finally, the day of the physical arrived and things went much as before, he passed nearly everything with flying colors, but when the time came to measure his heart rate, once again, it was well over 100. The army doctors promptly diagnosed him with tachycardia, scored his physical 4F, and sent him home. He's in his 70s now, and apart from his mysteriously high heart rate, which I inherited, he's always been in great cardiac health, and still is. I'm not gonna lie, if I was in a situation like that, I would not want to be drafted by any means. So I don't think I could ever fault somebody for doing what they could to make sure that they didn't have to get sent out to the Vietnam War. If I was in the dad situation and I was presented with this opportunity, I would be like getting as little sleep as possible all on the lead up to this day. I'd be like doing some heavy breathing techniques or like, you know, just trying to figure out some way to keep that heart rate just pounding. Our next story is from Star World 8311. Oh, you're giving all of us a failing grade in our final project? We're going to talk with the dean of the department then. The background. My humanities class was taught by three professors, team teaching, lectures, small groups, etc., and that worked out most of the time. However, our final project was a classroom simulated society, and they split the class in half to do this. They told us that we all had to stay in the rooms in a portable and couldn't leave. The rules for the project were that the students were split into upper class, middle class, and lower class groups, with each group having an irregular amount of tickets for travel, money, and food and drinks. The upper class got 10 tickets for almost every category, the middle class got 5, and the lower class got 2. Each of the three had to decide how to spend their tickets and could give them away if they chose. The upper class was the only one that had travel tickets and the lower class was the only one that had entertainment tickets, TV time. In the first two of the sections of the group project, 
all the students stayed the whole four hours and the project went about how you would expect it to go, with the upper class ruling the other two and taxing them in tickets. That section of the project was during the school day, between lunch and dinner. Our section was directly following them so we couldn't go to the dining hall for dinner. We also couldn't bring outside food or drinks. I had to eat on a schedule for medical reasons, but was told I would only be allowed to do so if I bought food or drink with our group's tickets. I was put into the upper class, so we had enough tickets for me to be able to do that, but then there were none for others to have anything. We, the five of us in the upper class, ended up splitting a can of pop and a small bag of chips. The people in our section of the project were mostly missionary kids, I'm not though, so we were mostly an idealistic bunch to begin with. All but one of the lower class group left the building to go eat dinner because they knew they weren't going to get fed otherwise. They weren't allowed back in and got failing grades because they didn't follow the rules for the project. The malicious compliance, the rest of us followed the rules to the letter, but we did it in our own way within the confines of those rules. The tickets got spread around mostly evenly so everyone could travel, have at least one food or drink for their class to split, and have entertainment tickets. When it got to be hour three of four, our class started singing, Show Me The Way To Go Home. We then started singing all the most annoying songs we could think of for the last hour. We absolutely drove the professors up a wall, but they couldn't tell us to leave because then they wouldn't have followed the project rules either. We knew we were playing with fire with this one because the project counted for a good chunk of our final grade. But we didn't care after finding out that the professors weren't going to allow any exceptions to the rules, even for medical reasons. After we were done, we went to see if there was any way we could still get dinner, and the cafeteria stayed open for us a half hour after it was supposed to close so we could eat. It was on a Friday night. The fallout on Monday afternoon, we all came into the lecture hall buzzing about the two extremes of the project. The people who ran off knew that they were going to fail, but the rest of us in both sections were sure we were going to get passing grades. We were all told that the first section, the one that imploded, would get passing grades, and the second section, the one that shared more equitability, would fail. One of my friends worked at the campus bookstore and knew that each stack of the project ticket slash rule books came with a teacher's manual. Since these professors did this project for all of their humanities classes at this level, they didn't get a new teacher's manual each year unless the project changed drastically. So the rest of the teacher's manuals were sitting in the back of the bookstore, locked up though. The friend told his boss what happened, and his boss gave him a teacher's manual. Those of us who had completed the failed section of the project had the professor's words on tape because we were allowed to record lectures. We took that and the manual and made an appointment as a group with the dean. The dean thought that the professors had been utterly ridiculous and we got passing grades for the project. The professors tried to argue that there was no way that the project could ever have had that outcome, but the dean didn't go along with that. His answer? You teach at a Christian university and expect that your students aren't going to follow their beliefs? The professor had to change the syllabus, so the next year, they had the simulated society project removed and something else put in its place with much better rules. I mean, I get it's a college course, but I'm just impressed that they were able to get away with preventing people from eating for medical reasons, threatening to fail somebody because they left because they have a medical condition. I think that could have come down on the college as a whole. And our final story of the day is from Doughboy Niels, Insecurity. I work at an airport as a law enforcement agent. One morning, roughly 4 a.m., me and my colleagues were on our way to an arriving flight. We got at security and were ready to pass. Mind you, we must pass through the metal detector, but we're not to be inspected. We can carry anything we need to do our job, and we carry weapons, etc., so we'll always set off the alarm. We have a special pass that'll allow us clearance. We don't need that pass to carry it, just to go through security. We approach security, and I suddenly realize I left my pass and my jacket in my locker. Flight was due any minute, so I decided to dodge the bullet and go through and be inspected. That did not sit well with the guard, and he was like, You can't go through the detector like this, and you can't use the security procedure. No pass, then no passage. Finally, he got me and had the power, basically forcing me to go back and be late. Then... 
It dawned on me. In front of the guard and one foot away from the detector, I took off all my gear, emptied my pockets, etc., gave everything to my colleague who did bring her pass. I went through the detector as clean as can be, no alarms. One foot after the detector, my colleague handed me my stuff. I put everything back on with the biggest smile and wished him a wonderful day. The expression on his face was priceless. We burst into laughing around the corner. Let's be real, they were definitely being overly picky by saying, oh no, you've got to have that pass. But this just goes to show it really helps to have a buddy or two that can just kind of cover for you when you're working. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.